on World News Tonight. End of an era. First woman to be the Speaker of the US House steps down from Democratic leadership. Tonight, find out who might take over her place. Deal extended. World's food supply worries calm as Black Sea ports continue exports. Mending ties. A powerful partnership breeds new life as China and Japan reaffirm their unity. And seasonal prep. European nations gear up for Christmas. The streets get a glow up in a shimmering light. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announces that she will step down as the top Democrat in the House. House Democrats appear likely to choose New York Rep. Hakeem Jeffries to succeed Speaker Pelosi, a potentially historic move to elect the first black person to lead a party in Congress. And with great confidence in our caucus, I will not seek re-election to Democratic leadership in the next Congress. Nancy Pelosi, the first woman to have served in the powerful position of Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, said she will step down as the Democratic leader. Marking the end of an era and a historic career of congressional leadership, notable for her ability to pass key legislation, keep her sometimes fractious House Democrats united, and challenge the world's most powerful men. Pelosi, who is 82, will remain in Congress, representing San Francisco in the House as she has done for 35 years. Her tenure spanning seven presidential administrations, during which she was twice elected as Speaker, a position third in line to the presidency. Her first stint as Speaker began in 2007 under Republican President George W. Bush. Calling Bush, quote, a total failure, Pelosi disagreed with many of his policies, particularly the U.S. war in Iraq, but worked with him to pass a fiscal stimulus bill, among other legislation. She remained Speaker until 2011, two years into Democrat Barack Obama's first term, helping to pass what is considered his signature legislative achievement, the Affordable Care Act. Today we have the opportunity to complete the great unfinished business of our society and pass health insurance reform for all Americans that is a right and not a privilege. Pelosi regained the speaker role in 2019 after Democrats took back control of the House during the presidency of Republican Donald Trump. Those tumultuous years were capped by Pelosi presiding over a House that twice impeached Trump, although the Senate voted to acquit him both times. President Trump is clearly ethically unfit and intellectually unprepared to be the president of the United States. That doesn't seem to matter to the Republicans in the United States Senate. Trump, joined by many Republicans, repeatedly vilified her, but she remained fiercely undaunted, and even publicly tore up a copy of his final State of the Union address, later telling Democratic lawmakers she did so because she, quote, couldn't find a page that didn't have a lie on it. When Trump supporters stormed the Capitol on January 6, 2021, some of them roared, we want Nancy, and looted her office. Oh my gosh, they're just breaking windows, they're doing all, they said somebody was shot. It's just, it's just horrendous. In late October of 2022, a man broke into her San Francisco home, echoing the Where's Nancy chant, hoping to take her hostage and break her kneecaps because he believed she was, quote, the leader of the pack of lies told by the Democratic Party. Pelosi was in Washington at the time. The intruder attacked her 82-year-old husband, Paul, with a hammer, according to police. Paul Pelosi required surgery for a fractured skull. The incident left the Pelosi family, in her words, quote, heartbroken and traumatized. It's going to be a long haul, but he will be well. And it, it's just so tragic how it happened. Pelosi's decision to step aside follows her party's loss of control of the House to Republicans in the midterm election. But in her final years as Speaker, and at one of the most divisive moments in American history, she marshaled the Democrats to pass much of President Joe Biden's legislative agenda, including a $430 billion climate change and drug pricing bill, 
a $1 trillion infrastructure bill, and a $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief bill. She also made her mark in foreign policy, most notably when she enraged China by becoming the highest-ranking U.S. official in 25 years to visit Taiwan, saying she was honoring America's commitment to the self-ruled island's, quote, vibrant democracy. And when announcing her future plans to the House, Pelosi spoke often of democracy and the recent midterm election, winning cheers from her colleagues. Last week, the American people spoke and their voices were raised in defense of liberty, of the rule of law, and of democracy itself. And in doing so, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. After winning control of the U.S. House of Representatives, Republicans said that investigating President Joe Biden and his family's business dealings will be their top oversight priority when they formally take power next year. Well, good evening. I'm proud to announce the era of one-party Democrat rule in Washington is over. Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader in the U.S. House of Representatives, heralded what will likely be two years of divided American government after Republicans clawed their way across the finish line to eke out what will likely be a razor-thin majority in the House. While President Joe Biden's Democratic Party defended its hold on the Senate, gains in the House give Republicans the power to rein in Biden's agenda, as well as to launch potentially politically damaging probes of his administration and family. While it falls far short of the red wave his party had hoped for, McCarthy tried to sound an optimistic note this week about the direction of the new Congress. And this new Republican leadership team is ready to get to work to put America back on the right track. It was our commitment to America that we would create an economy that is strong, a nation that is safe, a future that is built on freedom, and a government that is accountable. And that's exactly what we'll do. Republicans will hold power over the purse strings of government and wield the gavels in powerful committees. Already, they are planning to probe the Biden administration's policies and scrutinize spending. Representative Michael McCall, the Texas Republican in line to lead the House Foreign Affairs Committee, said he'd keep a close eye on the flow of weapons and aid to Ukraine. McCall told he had no plans to undercut Ukraine's defense, but said he wanted to see NATO partners bear part of the burden. McCall is also set to probe the hasty 2021 U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and scrutinize business dealings between the president's son, Hunter Biden, and a Chinese energy firm in 2017. Despite their new majority, Republicans' overall influence on foreign policy and beyond will be limited. To become law, any bills supported by Republicans must be passed by the Democratic-controlled Senate and signed by the Democratic president. Over in the war in Ukraine, Russia again released missiles on Ukrainian energy facilities as Moscow stepped up attacks in eastern Ukraine, reinforced by troops pulled from Kherson city, which Kyiv recaptured last week. Air raid sirens sound as the first snows fall on Kyiv. Ukrainians endured blackouts and freezing temperatures as Russia unleashed yet more missiles against energy facilities on Thursday. Authorities said they were working hard to restore power nationwide after what Ukraine said was the heaviest bombardment yet of civilian infrastructure this week. <laughs> President Volodymyr Zelensky posted this video, apparently shot from a car cam, showing a driver's journey through Dnipro interrupted by a huge blast. The location, but not the date it was shot, but local officials said at least 15 people were wounded in strikes on Dnipro. A large defence plant was also hit. Russian forces have stepped up attacks in eastern Ukraine, reinforced by troops pulled from Kherson in the south after Kyiv recaptured it last week. Explosions resounded in Odessa, the capital Kyiv, and Zaporizhia in the southeast. Meanwhile, fears of cross-border spillover have eased, since NATO and Poland concluded that a missile that crashed in Poland on Tuesday, killing two people, was probably a stray fired by Ukraine's air defences and not Russian. Zelensky contested this view in a rare public disagreement with his Western allies. And Ukraine has asked to view the site for itself, which a top Polish official said would probably be granted. Ukraine has vowed to keep up the pressure on Russian forces until it reclaims all occupied territory. Its capture of Kherson has stoked optimism. 
but the top U.S. general warned Ukraine's chances of near-term outright victory weren't high and said Russia still had significant combat power inside Ukraine. Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The probability of a Ukrainian military victory defined as kicking the Russians out of all of Ukraine to include what they define or what they claim as Crimea, to the probability of that happening anytime soon is not high, militarily. The Kremlin called on Washington to push Kiev towards diplomacy, accusing Ukraine of shifting the goalposts regarding possible peace talks. The controversial Black Sea grain deal, which was cause for much concern due to Russia's unwillingness to cooperate with Ukraine in the picture, is now being extended. The UN hailed the move and vowed for better support in the process. Agreement has been reached to extend the Black Sea grains deal. The news came early Thursday. Originally agreed in July, the pact creates a sea corridor for the export of grains from three ports in Ukraine. It's allowed some 11.1 million tonnes of grain to be shipped, alleviating global food shortages. Kyiv says it will now run for another 120 days. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres hailed the move to extend the agreement. He said the UN was also committed to removing obstacles to Russian exports of grains and fertilisers. That's a part of the deal that Moscow sees as critical. Such exports aren't officially affected by Western sanctions. But Russia complains they have been made difficult in practice. Negotiations continue over the country's exports of ammonia, a key ingredient in fertilisers. A UN official said solving the fertiliser crunch should be next on the to-do list. Grain prices fell following news of the extension. Wheat futures dropped over 2.5%, with corn also down. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news after this. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida have reaffirmed their willingness to improve bilateral relations between their countries. The leaders met in person for the first time. The leaders of China and Japan have agreed to improve bilateral relations between their nations going forward. Their first in-person meeting came Thursday in Bangkok, Thailand, on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. During the 45-minute long encounter, the two reaffirmed that they would reopen dialogue across all channels. During today's meeting, towards building constructive and stable relations between the two countries, we agreed to continue to communicate closely at all levels, including at the leadership level. Kishida explained that he expressed his concerns over the situation in the East China Sea as well as Beijing's military activities. However, he also stressed that a frank discussion was had regarding the overall direction of the bilateral relations between Asia's two largest economies. Despite tensions between the two Asian neighbors, she stressed the importance of the relationship between Beijing and Tokyo. As close neighbors, China and Japan are both important countries in Asia and the world. We have many mutual interests and space for cooperation. The importance of relations between China and Japan has not changed and will not change. During the meeting described by Kishida as being, quote, generally positive, the two countries agreed to expand the scope of cooperation to include green energy and culture. This was the first in-person top-level meeting between the leaders of China and Japan in about three years, at a time when Tokyo finds itself caught in the crossfire of escalating Washington-Beijing tensions. Their relations worsened in August as Beijing fired ballistic missiles into Tokyo's exclusive economic zone for the first time in response to U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. At the UN General Assembly, talks are underway to reform the Security Council. While there are rifts over whether to expand seats for permanent members, many say that reforming the Council will empower and benefit the UN. The Security Council, the main guarantor of the international peace and security, has remained blocked, unable to fully carry out its mandate. Growing numbers are now demanding its reform. 
The UN General Assembly President Kasava Kurosi has called for a reform of the UN Security Council, saying one third of world leaders underscored the urgent need to make changes to the Council. Delivering a speech to member states, he said a choice is at hand. Will the assembly continue its annual repetition of well-known positions, or will it swing into action to achieve breakthroughs? At the UN General Assembly meeting on Thursday, much of the debate centered on expanding the number of member states on the Security Council. Seoul's ambassador to the UN, Hwang Jung-guk, said South Korea supports the idea of increasing the number of member states, but not increasing the number of permanent members. The Republic of Korea strongly believes that adding permanent members undermines the adaptability, sustainability, and relevance of the Security Council over the long term. Expanding the permanent membership basically means adding particular country names to Article 23 of the Charter. But once we add names, we cannot change them. Instead, Ambassador Huang urged countries to consider holding regular elections to select non-permanent members under a bigger council, which would be more representative and inclusive. Several countries, including Italy, Spain, Canada, Mexico and Argentina, also oppose the idea of having more permanent members and are arguing for more non-permanent seats. But on the other hand, the so-called G4 countries of Germany, Japan, India and Brazil are pushing for the expansion of permanent membership, as is the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. The failure of the Security Council to adopt a resolution on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and North Korea's series of ballistic missiles has put a spotlight on calls for Security Council reform. Now, Iran has issued a series of death sentences as women-led protests over Masa Amini's death in custody entered the third month, with clashes reportedly claiming at least seven lives in the past two days. Street violence raged across Iran as protests sparked by the death of Amini intensified on the anniversary of a lethal 2019 crackdown. Tireless chants of defiance continued to fill the air across Iran, and the reciprocal crackdown by the government shows little sign of easing. On Wednesday, a court in Tehran sentenced three more protesters to death on charges of committing crimes against the country's security and engaging in street warfare. The latest sentences bring the total number of protest-related death penalties to five, with charges filed against more than 2,000 individuals across the country in connection to the unrest. The outrage was triggered by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in police custody after she was arrested for allegedly breaching Iran's strict dress code for women. The demonstrations have snowballed into a broader nationwide movement against Iran's clerical rulers that have retained power since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. As protests enter the third month this Wednesday, human rights groups have estimated the death toll by security forces to be more than 300 people, including women and children, with thousands arrested, which Iranian authorities deny. Hundreds of Twitter employees are estimated to be leaving the beleaguered social media company following an ultimatum from new owner Elon Musk that staffers sign up for long hours at high intensity or leave. Twitter has closed its offices and cut staff access until Monday. It comes as hundreds of employees are leaving the company after the new CEO, Elon Musk, gave them an ultimatum, work hardcore or get fired. Some took to the social media app to announce their departure, posting the accompanying hashtag, love where you worked, past tense. According to one source, security officers had begun kicking employees out of the office on Thursday evening. Just a day earlier, Musk emailed Twitter employees asking them to commit to, quote, working long hours at high intensity. The email asked staff to click yes if they wanted to stick around. Those that didn't respond would be considered to have quit and given a severance package. A poll on the workplace app Blind found that more than 40% of 180 poll participants had chosen to leave. A quarter said they were staying reluctantly and just 7% said they clicked yes to stay, I'm hardcore. Blind verifies employees through their work email addresses and allows them to share information anonymously. Musk has already cut around half of Twitter's 7,500 workforce, including top management. 
The departures include many engineers responsible for fixing bugs and preventing service outages, raising questions about the stability of the platform. The social media company, which has lost many of its communication team members, did not respond to a request for comment. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. China has expanded the world's first inhalable COVID-19 vaccine nationwide. The vaccine is targeted at people over 18 who have completed their primary immunization over six months ago. Saudi's Crown Prince is visiting Seoul for the first time in three years to mark 60 years of diplomatic ties. During a summit with President Yoon, the duo agreed to develop a new strategic partnership. The United States and its allies, including South Korea, Japan and Canada, condemn North Korea after Pyongyang fired a suspected intercontinental ballistic missile with enough range to hit the U.S. mainland. NASA's Artemis 1 mission has sent its first image of the Earth from the uncrewed Orion spacecraft. Orion captured a view of Earth about nine hours after it was launched. A few days left from the start of the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. It's the first time for the global sporting event to happen at this time of the year in the Middle East. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has announced a day of mourning after at least 21 people were killed in a fire that tore through an apartment building in the Gaza Strip. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with how European countries gear up for the Christmas season by switching on the lights in stores and streets. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.